David Campbell is a professor at uh, Culinary Arts at the State University of New York at Cobble Skill. Anyone ever been there? It's really a delight. Yeah. It's a great one. I was there years ago during an accreditation visit. I love going to a town, a school that didn't have to have a street address. <laughs> right? Right? I remember mailing things to SUNY Cobble Skill. Cobble Skill, New York, whatever. I was going, wait, is there something missing? <laughs> I thought that was very cool. He's an active member of the ACF, and he's a certified culinary educator, certified chef de cuisine, and approved certification evaluator. He has degrees from Johnson and Wales, the University of Houston, and the University of Albany. His particular areas of interest include American regional cuisine, barbecue, making on barbecue, Darvishay, molecular gastronomy, and the subject of which we are going to speak, beer and wine. And he's, oh, okay, he spent the fall 2014 semester on sabbatical, traveling and eating the North Carolina barbecue yes. trail. That's the right. That's, good. That's, good. That's, good. That's our first presenter. And he's co-presenting with David. They're both Davids. You realize that, right? A lot of them here. Mm -hmm. Right, there are. Um, David Yanisco has been assistant professor uh, for three years, 12 years experience as a chef and a la carte private and dining. And I think this is so relevant to what's happening. And in, in, in not a huge percentage of the dining world, but in a significantly sophisticated um, mm -hmm. portion. And certainly sous vide is a little bit more than um, he's heavily influenced and classically trained in French brigade and contemporary restaurants. His interests include food preservation, charcuterie, food and beverage fermentation, regional U.S. and European continental foodways. He's pursuing a master's in career and technical education from SUNY Oswego, and he's pursuing a CEC from the ACF. He's a graduate of University of Rochester and Johnson and Wales, and he's also a culinary advisor and coach of student competitions in Chez de Rotisserie or I speak Spanish and German, so he's French young chef. Young chef competition. That's right. Sam Pellegrino's almost famous chef competition and the New York Beef Council. Council competition. I think it's great. I know many of you spend many, many extra hours coaching students in competitions, and what a wonderful experience for everyone. And just I want to thank any of you who are doing that because it, it teaches a lot. I think we learn a lot too. And what the self confidence you give to students doing that is just wonderful. So we're very lucky to have the David and David show. I hope you enjoy your hour, and we'll see you for a recap of the whole day down in the amphitheater. It's just a quick 30 minutes. Many people told us one of the favorite parts of the conference is the recap. So don't skip it. I, I really think uh, you'll love it. Sorry you've taken so much time. Thank you. It's, exactly. No, I was going to say, there's another I know, right? yes. picture of the eggs, too, in the same way. And I was like, ah, you sure? Okay. Um, now this this is, we're going to be talking quite a bit today about um, various types of equipment that's out there, and um, I just actually started up really doing this this molecular gastronomy. Even if some people don't like that term necessarily, but really just started up last last semester. I did a class called Taste Trends and Technology, and we spent about half the class on um, kind of sensory analysis. I've always thought in culinary schools a lot of times we teach them so much about cooking. We never really sat down and teach them really about tasting that much. And, and we used a lot of these types of, of equipment, too. And the part that really stood out to me was how much the students were into it. I mean, it was just, you know, there's times if you're teaching hospitality math or sanitation, they can be pretty dry topics. They can. Dry to listen to, dry to teach. I, I know. I've done them before, too. Please don't put me in a math class. Um, but uh, this particular type of stuff, it, it's the same way I found with barbecue. Students are just hanging all over the place. I need somebody to stay up all night and cook the pigs so I can go home and sleep. Chef, can we do it? Can we do it? Literally, they're fighting you to do it. And I found the same thing with this type of cooking also. The students were really there. Chef Steps, you're right. They were right on it. It's amazing. It's amazing. That, that's, a, you know, that's kind of almost a handbook or, or, a, you know, or a textbook that you can use. It is quite amazing. And I saw this, and I thought this would be kind of a good thing to start off with, because even though we've got a lot of different types of equipment here, I think of all the equipment that we, that we have up here, this is probably really the one that, that, that is most ingrained, and, and it's, it's one that's not going away. You know, I think maybe we've done the foam thing where it went up, and maybe it's down a little bit now, but sous vide is, is, is definitely in every kitchen. Um, 
the vacuum packers, again, every kitchen has them now. It's just part of the curriculum, and we're just starting to do it a little bit right now in, in our program. How many of you are doing it right now in, in, your, in, in your program? I, is it built into the program, or is it something you're just adding? You add it in there? Um, I, we had the ACF come by about I think it was two or three years ago and did our, did our um, yeah, re recertification or reaccreditation, and they asked a little bit about it. I haven't seen it in the in the competencies yet, but they did ask if we were actually covering it there. So you're utilizing technology and modern cooking methods, most of you or about half of you? If, if you haven't done it, what, what's keeping you from, from doing it? I'm just curious, is it, is it the cost of the equipment? Is it, you're not really sure about how to do all of it? You know? We just got started recently and I found that uh, cost is certainly an issue. It is, it is. But um, the lack of any textbook there is a new textbook that just came out. It is. Now it's funny because th that came out just a just maybe a week and a half before my class began, and they sent it to me. And, and it is. It's very detailed. And I'm like. I'm, I'm not going to have time to even absorb this. I would because it is. It's very detailed. It looks like a very good book, though. Very good. From my point of view, and Frank, do you are you trying to incorporate it into I use it a as standing an class? No, I use it as an elective. Okay. So I teach the fundamentals at Student Couple Skills. So I teach culinary one and two. Um, so I get students that some have been in a professional kitchen. A lot of them don't even know how to hold a chef's knife yet. Uh, and I am trying my best to incorporate some of these techniques into what we do. I use Professional Cooking by Gislin, and the latest edition has, the eighth edition has, some modern gastronomy wrapped into all of the recipes. Sorry, not all the recipes, some of the recipes. On the Canadian so, version of that textbook, they've actually got like some verification data already on the cover of it. I don't know what it there is. There is. The green, uh, yeah. the green caviar. Yeah, same, same in the state. Uh, so there is verification, there is sous vide, and those types of things in the textbook itself. So I have yet to incorporate it into my culinary one or two classes. But I think I need to, because like David said, sous vide is not going away. Uh, Vacuum packing is not going away. If you have walked through any of these, yes, any of the kitchens here, every kitchen has a vacuum packing machine. So we need to teach students how to use them correctly. Yes, ma'am. We've been using sous vide and um, the vacuum pack machine for garmage. That's how we introduced it. Most That's a great way to do it, too. It really is. I think it works perfectly with pâtés and terrines. Mm -hmm. If you just get them perfectly cooked, yeah. it's a great way to do it. You know? and, and I mentioned this before. It's a great hook. And, and what I meant by that is just the students are just dying to learn about it. They really are. Um, I mentioned the barbecue thing and how much the students were in, interested in that. And we had an instructor uh, several years ago. He was a very, very talented pastry chef, really talented. And, and what you would typically think of as just being one of those artists. He was so brilliant in one area. And I mean, he never cut his ear off, but I think he was probably pretty close. I mean, he was, you know, he was just brilliant. And, and um, he would start off actually the first class in, in baking. These kids were 18 years old, and he would actually do, uh, he would temper chocolate and have them do the little chocolate spritzes on the first day. And, and this is when I first started up there, too. And you know, when you're younger, you, you got it all figured out. Somehow when you get older, you, you realize you don't know nearly as much. But I'm thinking, ah, these guys don't even know how to make biscuits. What are you having tempering chocolate for? He told me exactly that. He's like, they come in, they've always wanted to go to culinary school. He goes, so on the very first day, I try to do something really, really cool for them, and they never forget it. And then later on, when I start doing stuff that's a little bit drier, they're, they're willing to do that, because they know that we've got the capability to move into some different areas, too. So it really is. It's a great hook. I was so pleased with how the students reacted there and how they would go to chef steps, and literally they were sending me uh, emails all the time. Get some of this, chef. Get some of this. And it was just a one-day-a-week class. So I literally could go to Modernist Pantry, put an order in, and have the stuff there by, you know, by the next class for them. The objectives here, I'll go through there you know, relatively quick. I'm going to talk a little bit about some low-cost options, because some of this is expensive. And some of it, honestly, you're probably not really going to buy. I mean, we, we had some grant money that got us a couple of these items. Um, 
even if I were still chair, I don't think I'd spend money on some of this, on some of this stuff. It's a little bit nuts. Um, how to put it into your curriculum, um, how consistency, flavor profiles, and impact the bottom line. That's really a big thing for this sous vide. Um, it, it's pretty amazing what you can do out there. Because everyone thinks with all just the, the great texture and the unbelievable flavor profiles and all that, but um, super, super consistent as uh, Chef, is it Houghton or Houghton? Houghton? Houghton House, you know, Chef Houghton was saying, super consistent. I mean, boom, that's it. It, it either is or it isn't. You get it right to the temperature that you want to get. Um, flavor pro profiles can be great. And then bottom line, too, because this stuff can last for a while. And then hopefully we can get you to, you know, get your students at least to look at it a little bit from art, craft, and science. You know, just speaking of science and some of these issues, they might not be really interested in doing it. But when it's science for food and they're in culinary arts, they pick it up kind of quick. Oops. Okay. First one, and we've got a thermal circulator over. This is kind of an older one, too. I don't think the new ones really look like this anymore. Has anyone bought one recently? Are, are most of them now kind of like more of a black plastic type of thing? Yes. Um, this one was, well, you know, it was several years ago. Um, you know, obviously it's used for sous vide. And again, that is the thermal circulator. Yeah. I think that's an industrial one. I think when I bought some polyscience, there's a couple of different ones. Right. That's like the industrial Okay, kind of used almost for sometimes medical or, or other and items there. And also bigger amounts of water. Oh, oh, nice. You know? it, it, and as you mentioned, too, in yours, it, people sometimes think of these as being the sous vide. It's not. These are thermal circulators. We've got one plugged in over here. Um, thought it'd be a good idea just to really let people see, you know, how it works, basically. Hopefully, there's some water moving in there because, um, again, you want it to actually be circulating around a little bit. Um, poaching is, is another way to do it, too. I mean, you know, I guess you could look at sous vide as poaching. But when I think of doing some of these, uh, the, the pâtés and terrines, just a great way to do it. You can just get the perfect temperature without the fat kind of leaching out and just get this perfect consistency to it. A bain-marie, I wouldn't go out and spend money necessarily to use it as a bain-marie, but I was at a competition a couple of years ago, actually at that uh, San Pellegrino competition about three years ago, and there was a student who had a, a thermal circulator set in, into a pan, and that was their bain-marie. I thought it was kind of a nice way to do it because they kept it warm. I mean, it circulated the water so that she could make up her potato puree very quickly, put it in there, put a cover over it, kept it warm for the competition. And I've also used it for mozzarella cheese, too, to get just, you know, just the right temperature for that. Works pretty well. You, know? you just have to be careful so it doesn't all get sucked in there. And be a, you can imagine, it would be a mess. It, it could, could be a mess, OK? Uh, and this does. This allows you to dial in a very specified temperature with minimal variance. I mean, you can just pick your temperature. Um, I still do the Fahrenheit thing. I never really got, you know, hadn't gotten used to the Celsius thing. Um, it, it seems like a lot of this, I mean, you, obviously, you can go either way, and you can s select which side you want to go on there, but it seems like a lot of chefs now are doing Celsius, so just used to doing that. And then something I heard of doing too, and it works well, I've done it a few times, is consider retrofitting a cooler as your cooking vessel. Get yourself just a, a good sized cooler. Don't go out and get the absolute best one in the world, but get a, a decent sized cooler, and you can kind of cut the sides a little bit if you have to, and you can set this in there, put warm water in there, you know, so it doesn't have to work as hard. And then once it gets up to the correct temperature, it stays at that temperature for quite a while. I mean, you've got a cooler in it. So it's, you know, in, in some ways, maybe it's sustainable. Maybe it's green that you're actually using a little bit less, less water. And I did a Super Bowl party one year. I always do these really big Super Bowl parties. And I try to have the cuisine based on whatever the teams are. You know, I didn't really know what I was going to do when it was the Indianapolis Colts. I wasn't really sure <laughs> what their cuisine is. Um, but uh, w one year, I actually did um, sausage in it, OK, when, when, the, when the Packers were in it. And I, I literally just filled the container with beer, cheap beer. And I just put sausages in there and literally poached them. <coughs> so I had a 165 degree <coughs> bath of warm beer. And then I put the sausages in. They were unbelievable, OK? But the texture is different, as you mentioned, too. It almost puts some people off. It's so. It's so moist, especially with chicken. Yeah. It's so moist that sometimes people are like, that's not done. I swear it's done. But, and there are actually other versions, too. Here's one that I picked up, OK? Anova. Anyone seen these before? Your marketing is not an awful lot. They're, they're, they're pretty nice. They're on sale 50 bucks off until Father's Day through the website. So it's $139. I, 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 I got to buy one. I'm a father. I need to buy one for myself, OK? Uh, I, I got this one, I guess, uh, Kickstarter. I think I paid $149. You know how Kickstarter, they'll start off at $99, and there's so many. Um, it's pretty neat. There's even there's an app for it on a cell phone, OK? Um, I, I'm not that, that slick yet. I haven't actually put it on the phone, but you can adjust it via your cell phone. Um, it's kind of a neat thing, though. There's actually a little clip here, and you can put it to the back of your pot. A Nova. OK? And it, it really, I mean, a lot of people are using these things. These, this is almost like the the crock pot of the new, new millennium? Isn't there one to bid on at the time of 
I don't, I'm not even sure, was there? The bed price just went up dramatically. It, they, they really are. Now, I mean, I, I use this a little bit in, in the kitchen. You know, I mean, this is my own that I bought, and I use it a little bit, but not a ton necessarily, just because it's not really designed to go with like something like that. You know, I mean, I don't think you could use this day in and day out, but it's kind of neat at home. I've done it before a couple times. Um, works well. You know, I'll, I'll put some pork belly and just pop it in there and let it go for quite a while and leave a note up to tell my wife and my kids, don't touch it, just let it go. Um, anything you want to add to the... Uh, it, it does. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what it is. I mean, I, I haven't used it in a, in a really big pot. It, it would probably work this little Lexon tub over here, too. Yeah. And, and as the chef mentioned earlier, too, this is one of the Lexon tubs that actually has the little slot cut out in the top there. Um, you know, and I actually, it was some grant money, I actually just bought the one with the top cut out. Where Any self-respecting chef would just cut it out by themselves and, <laughs> and, and tell you how much money they save. That's, that's what we do, right? Yeah, all right. Um, I, use a, I use a bandsaw for meat class. <laughs> That's it, I know, <laughs> you know. And then, okay, as far as for proteins for thermal circulator, you can get a very precise doneness. It's really amazing what you can do. Um, and in braised items, short ribs, I mean, short ribs are probably the big item that's been done for years and years and years. And it kind of, in some way, kind of angers some of us because short ribs used to be kind of affordable, and now they're just crazy expensive. It's just nuts, and that's because of this. People are taking this, this short rib thing and just, um, you know, and, and doing it sous vide like this, and it's, it's wonderful. I mean, just a great texture. Um, you're going to get maximum yield because you're really not shrinking things up, almost like the way we used to do with the Alto Shams where you take your roast beef and cook it slow, and you'd get, you know, maybe a, at least a good portion out of each, each prime rib just because of that. So you get maximum yield. And then you can either do some, some interesting things too, like duck confit. You know, instead of doing it, instead of having, it used to be, you know, you might even have to buy like a, a tub of separate duck fat because you never really had enough, okay? I don't think any, anyone ever has enough duck fat because it is pretty great stuff. <laughs> but this way, you can actually put it in the bag itself, okay? You, you know, put a little cure on it, let, let it do its thing, rinse it off, put it in with a couple tablespoons of fat and, um, and, and really make kind of a nice product. Um, and you can see the salmon right in the middle on the left, how, how really perfect that is. And on the right, you know, kind of what you think of as kind of traditional salmon, I guess, as far as cook-wise. And Dave, you can jump in any time you want, Dave, okay? This one is really neat. I've been more impressed by vegetables than anything else. And I was lucky enough to take a class a couple of, it might have been five months ago, it was Rich Rosendale, Rosendale, you know, certified master chef. I think he's been on some of these. He was at the Greenbrier for a long time, and now he's kind of doing his own thing. And um, Dave actually took the same class a couple of months prior. And the vegetable is just, just amazing. I mean, he, they would have vegetables come in on Monday at the Greenbrier, and they would literally, like, all hands on deck, everyone would peel and trim, and then they'd have a bunch of compound butters. And it's kind of neat because compound butters, in some way, are very, very old school. You know, I mean, they've been around for a really long time, but you're adding something that's kind of old school in a way, these compound butters, and adding to something new. Um, I always find go a little bit easy on the herbs in the bag. I find sometimes if you put a little bit too much in there, like on that video, the one, they were putting a big piece of rosemary. I'm just thinking, man, that's a lot of rosemary. Yeah. It really gets kind of intense. So I try to go kind of easy, just myself, in the bag, and then maybe I'll hit it with some, some herbs at the end, too. Um, other colors remain pretty good. You're right. I mean, green vegetables can lose their color pretty quickly. Portion, bag, and cook for the week. And perfect fork tender. It's nice. It really is. I mean, you can do it if you're going to have three baby carrots for every portion. Put it in the bag, it's done. You know, you reach into your refrigerator, boom, it's done. You know, I've always liked doing that type of thing, anything in restaurants. I'm kind of, I guess I'm, you know, kind of anal in some ways that I like to know what my exact portion numbers. I don't want to reach in here and say, it looks like we've got about 10 portions left. I want to know how many portions exactly do we have. And the vegetables are just amazing, what you can do with them. I mean, you talk fork tender, it's just absolutely perfect. Anyone done them before? Vegetables in it? You know? Yeah, it is. It's, it's usually a higher temperature, too. I think 80, 85 Celsius, I believe. That's one I, on top of my head that I'm thinking of Celsius, even though I'm more of a, a Fahrenheit person. Yes? We did gri I did grits. Did really? You know, I did a shrimp and grits, and the grits stayed fluffy and tender and because they didn't have a chance to dry out. They were amazing. That's pretty nice, yeah. Actually, the, the thing that impresses me the most with the roast circulators, something that I always find difficult to cook is the selection of the uh, octopus. Do you have a practical concept? Right. <laughs> you do it to be, it's Egypt proof. That's the most tender octopus that you ever have. And so the part that I really also like about Suvi is 
yes, it's great to have trying new things, but to fix all problems is what I love. Um, for example, a lot of uh, students uh, will say, well, uh, you teach us how to do a holiday stuff, for example, like I'm working in a restaurant, and it's not feasible to do it the classical way because the shop life is too short. I'm not going to be. Now you introduce saying to them uh, holiday stuff sous vide, and now it's like you're doing beautiful products and you have a shop like that you're requiring in the restaurant and the ease of doing it. So you don't have to get that powder uh, mm -hmm. nonsense because of you know, ease of service. You can have something that is from scratch, high quality with the ease of service. And the minute you, you, you point that that you fix a problem, the kids are all over it. Well, now, where'd you find the bags with the eight slots for the octopuses? <laughs> but you just put a, a, a glove. Okay. <laughs> That's it, right? <laughs> That's not a bad way to do it there. I, I like that. Good answer. All right. And you mentioned eggs, too. This is a great way to do it for culinary educators, too, because we, we all know how expensive it is. You know, it is. And, and eggs are cheap. So this is a good way to do it. And you can cook eggs cheap, too. That's what really one of the knocks of proteins, I think, in culinary arts, at least for, for, for me, is you know, if you're doing it for 15, 20 hours sometimes, it's like, you know, you put it on and you gotta wait until the next class or you wait until a day and a half. You have to time it so someone's gonna be there. But the eggs, you can do them super, super quick. Dave, you wanna to, uh, to jump on some of this egg? egg? Yeah, uh, especially for eggs hollandaise or any type of uh, poached egg, 63 degrees uh, in the shell. Just take your egg. If you have a uh, Lexan like this with a lid, you can put your eggs in there for your uh, service. If it's a brunch service, that way you have poached eggs on demand. You don't have to have your pot of water with uh, vinegar in it. You take your egg out, crack it into a smaller bowl, and then you can go ahead and remove it from the bowl and, and make your plate. Uh, I've, used it, I've used it extensively for brunch services and uh, and, and dinner services as well, where we need a, a poached egg, maybe on a salad, Leonese, or something like this. Uh, and it's, it's almost full. Almost full. You have to remember to put eggs in it when you, when you, when you uh, <laughs> get to the end. Um, or have your students remember to get eggs in it and not use them all up. And just plan ahead, just, just a little bit. Yep. I, I know Rich <coughs> Rosendale, too. He, he, now, he did, I think, his at 62.5 degrees. I guess when he was at the Greenbrier, and what he would do is he would take it out and he would crack it into a small dish, and then he would still put it into that poaching liquid. Maybe just made it look correct. Eight seconds is what he said. So literally, he would take it out, crack it, eight seconds in this poaching liquid, and because it's partially cooked anyway, it doesn't spread out. It doesn't get kind of those that octopus thing going on. It need to be trimmed. Um, real nice though, but I mean, just think of the labor savings there, rather than literally having someone there the whole time. And at a place like that, I think they do a lot of of eggs Benedict. And then the creme anglaise, too, awesome. Great way to do it. Pop it all in there, put everything into the bag itself, okay? Um, you know, keep it just below the point where the eggs are going to coagulate on you, okay? And um, 20 minutes, take it out, ice water, you know, or, you know, an ice bath for the most part, and you can set it in your shelf for, you know, probably more than a week, but I, I wouldn't go probably more than a week or so, just, just to keep everyone happy. And, and actually, speaking of that, too, one thing, I, kind of a disclaimer I wanted to say, I wasn't really going to talk about sanitation and hazard. I mean, it's vitally important. I'm not trying to downplay it, but everyone's got different rules depending on where you are. And I've seen a lot of times these types of things just kind of go off on a tangent, and we're just arguing about HACCP regulations. And I'd rather just kind of keep it more about the technique itself. But great way to do creme anglaise. And then obviously, of course, that creme anglaise means that you've got an ice cream custard always sitting there, too. Real nice way to do it. Um, you know, and, and it's good, too, because it, it is. It's consistent. It basically is foolproof for the most part. Okay, vacuum packers, um, seventy-nine dollars to about fifteen hundred. They actually get a lot more even than fifteen hundred. When I say seventy-nine, too, I'm talking about one of these guys right here. These little food savers. Anybody use these things? They work pretty well. I mean, I, you know, they 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 do. They 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 work pretty well for some things. I mean, you're not going to get a lot of compression and some of the other cool things that you might do with them, but they work pretty well. And it is a good way to um, you know once you start using them, too. My gosh, it's how did I ever get along without this thing? We had a student-run restaurant, and um, we used some local cheeses. And cheeses are expensive. I mean, even cheap cheese is expensive, uh, you know? But I mean, you get good local cheese. I think they were between $19 and $22 a pound for this cheese. 
And so, you know, each, each one of those blocks were maybe a hundred and something dollars. And we would, you know, cut a small piece off for kind of for the night. We'd take it out maybe an hour and a half before service actually began. And then we'd cryo back the rest of it up. And at the end of the night, we would, you know, cryo back that other one up there. And it lasts the entire semester. Did not lose a single piece of cheese. Okay? And again, it's expensive. That's why I kind of cringe sometimes when I go to these buffets and you'll just see a ton of cheese. It's all been cubed up. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's red because it's right beside the strawberry and it's kind of getting dry and there's not a whole lot you can really do with it then either. This was a great way to really save. Yes? I was just going to say one of the things we invested in on our campus is there's an insert that you can get for them now that's angled. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing the sous vide, the liquid stays down because mm. it, it doesn't drip out into the crab. Yeah. That would be nice. And and someone's cleaning it for Correct. It's all worth however like hard 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 it was. It's just angled. So. <laughs> yes, sir. With the cheese, do you still get the mold development? No, I, no, no. I, I didn't, nope, not at all. It, it, the entire, it was great, the entire semester. Because even plastic wrap and sh uh, shrink wrap, right. you're still, you know, obviously depends on how you handled it. Mm -hmm. That's going to contribute. To well, you're right, you're right. If you left it out too much or if you're, you know, always you right. gloved hands, that kind of thing. Um, and, and again, these little, and, and I just used the food saver when I was doing it for the cheese, so it wasn't even a strong pulling thing. It wasn't anything high tech. And the good part about it is it was a very, very small restaurant. So I could just kind of keep this on a shelf someplace and it didn't take out. Those things are big. I mean, even the small ones are good size. They're heavy. Yeah, so you start talking about an 8, 10, 12 year old cheddar, something like that, big cost. You don't want to have to be cutting anything off of that no. from a yield standpoint. Right. And it's funny you say that. When I, one of the first cooking jobs that I got was down in Savannah, Georgia. And had a big piece of cheese, and she asked me to cut a little bit of it off, and I didn't know much about cheese. So I was over-eager. I was going to do my thing, and I ended up cutting it into a bunch of small pieces and wrapped them all up. And she was actually very nice about it and explained to me, no, just keep it in a large whole piece and then cut off a little bit as you need it. You know, I probably had 50 different pieces there. Probably lo lost a lot of money. You know, so you're not really going to have a whole lot of pulling on these things here for, com for compression. And then um, this Vacmaster VP112, it's like $535 on Amazon, and it's free shipping. Okay, the free shipping for something that heavy, that's kind of crazy, but it's a really nice one too. I mean, it might not be, if you're in a kitchen, it might not be big enough. It, it is a professional model. It might not be big enough for a true kitchen, but um, I was talking to one of the instructors here and he was gonna actually buy one for home. I'm like, yeah, my wife's okay with it. We do a lot of charcuterie. I'm like, really? You know, it's, yeah, people are into it, but 535. I mean, it's not a bad price. They are coming down a little bit. And in the, the various types. Dave, you want, you want to jump on some of these? That, there might be one there that's, uh, yeah, the compression that uh, Dave is referring to is, is actually changing the cell structure. And what we do with this is with melons, uh, different fruits, actually compress that fruit uh, and change the cell structure and you get a different texture. So you can teach textures with, um, with these large, so the larger vacuum packers. Um, these small ones, like you said, do, do not have the pull. Uh, these are also, the smaller ones are good as are the larger ones for uh, quick pickling as well. So if you want to make uh, with just tablespoons of pickling liquid, you can pickle your white uh, asparagus or green beans or what it is, whatever it is, very, very quickly uh, with the vacuum. Uh, that last machine that you were just talking about, that's a chamber sealer. I've never seen one before. Is there enough pull on that to do? Like, I haven't done any compression stuff. <coughs> It should be. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's all fair. It's not just stuck in here. Like, the it's, like this. Yeah. It's kind of neat too with this. Um, oops. Sorry. It, with the uh, compression thing also, is that uh, let me get back here. Um, I've seen, and you probably have all seen it too. Watermelon that's actually been compressed. You can cut it in nice little square pieces and compress it, and it kind of looks like tuna. You can almost do a plate, kind of a little play on that. Maybe get kind of a a little bit of maybe a rice pudding that can almost kind of have a rice look to it, and you can almost make it look like it's a sushi plate in a way but with the, you know, with the watermelon, it just really compresses it. And of course, not only compresses it, but it's pulling something into there. So if you want to use melon and maybe take some Medora, Midori liquid, okay, and when you compress it, kind of pull that in there, really get some nice flavors there. Um, yes? I did the watermelon and then I cooked it. And it was like steak. I cooked no vegetarian steak. Wow. It wasn't very good, but we did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's honest, I like that. <laughs> This is one that Rich talked about too, which I thought was kind of neat. And I say Rich like he's a buddy of mine. He did a great job with it though. He gave me some good ideas. Oops, doing this again. Okay, as far as this uh, twill batter, you know, you're trying to get some of, you know, a lot of times when you make this kind of thing, you need to set it aside and let it kind of absorb. Um, for competitions, he likes to use this vacuum packer for that. 
you'll put the cup in there with the twill batter and literally just kind of, you know, pull, pull the mixture. Use the compression to literally pull the mixture in there. So that he that's can, no bag, that's just like the product. Right, it's just the product it. itself, okay? And then of course you've got compression as a technique, which is right what we're talking about up here. And then also for storage too. You know, if you just want to store things. We had that pork class yesterday and they were talking about the head. And uh, he would get uh, pigs in, they would split the head, he would cure it and then he would seal it up, cook it sous vide, and he would just have literally a couple of, you know, three or four half peg heads that would literally be sitting in bags in his refrigerator. And then if people came by that he knew were kind of foodies who were willing to kind of, you know, let the chef kind of do his thing, then he would just, he know, knows it was coming. Maybe it was a five or six course meal and he would just pop the pig head into the oven. It was already cooked. Just pop it into the oven and send it out to the table, okay? Another one I saw that was really neat too when I got a chance to taste it, vacuum force needs, okay, to remove the bubbles. You know, you want to get it, because you know how it is. I mean, you make it, and then you cook it later on, you cut into it, and you see the little bubbles in there from the air. He did it about three times in this container, literally, you know, vacuumed it about three times. And then we got a chance to try it later on, and it was just perfect, perfectly smooth. Kind of a neat thing. And he also did it to plump up some herbs and microgreens, too. You couldn't really tell by looking at them necessarily afterwards if you were just looking at them by themselves, but if you compared the ones that had been plumped up with the other ones, you could definitely tell. He took a small container, ice water, put the microgreens in there, put it into the vacuum packer, ran a couple of cycles on it, and literally it's almost like, you know, it's kind of like you do with celery where you might add some cold water to it and it kind of stiffened it up a little bit. It literally pulled this cold water right into it and his, and his greens kind of, you know, a lot really kind of plumped up a little bit. Kind of neat. Okay, who's used this before? Anyone? I, I actually, I, I borrowed one from a guy today, and Dave, have you, you said you've used them before? You, you want to jump on this one then? Sure. <laughs> so, um, what we have basically is a burn chamber. When we, some of you that walked in may have uh, smelled some smoke <laughs> uh, right around the 3 o'clock, maybe right before 3 o'clock, and I said to him, you know, we really need to be careful with that. We don't want, uh, no, no, don't want to evacuate the building. So. You have a burn chamber right here where we add some wood chips to. Uh, it's really just uh, uh, wood shavings. And we light them on fire and turn the pump on in the back and it draws. What it basically does is draw that smoke through the machine and to the tube. So you can quick smoke something. Um, think of maybe a piece of salmon, maybe a piece of gravlax that you have. You can put it in a bag, Ziploc bag, add some of the smoke and let it sit for uh, a minute or two, maybe five minutes before you send it out to the table. <coughs> Same with um, pork chops and those types of things. Really, anything that you want to quick smoke is something we want to use here. Of course, <coughs> for dramatic presentations, you can put it under the cloche if you're at someplace very fancy as you present it. To the table, you can present your smoked oysters or uh, whatever it is, just like Heston Blumenthal does right here. And you see that uh, quite uh, pretty dramatic one, yeah. quite, quite dramatic. You see, it. Heston Blumenthal does it, uh, they do it out at Alinea as well. Grant Hackett's does it. I, I see some cool drinks made too. I went to a bar one time and they were doing a Bloody Mary, Absolutely. and they literally inserted the tube into the, into the drink itself and did it. It is. It's kind of, I mean, I've even seen on, online where you can kind of make these things for a certain amount of money. One of our chefs made one with um, a, an aquarium pump and some tubing <laughs> and a shoebox and it cost him eight bucks. I know, it's and just, it works great. I know. I, and I love that kind of stuff. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a pride thing. The cheaper you can do it, that's yeah, great, I, you know? Well, he's and it, I mean, it is kind of a, you know, it, it gets some, some comments usually when students see it. I mean, I, I got a feeling it'd be very popular in Colorado. Um, you know, because it's, you fill the top there, you light it, and you do your thing. Uh, I actually, I borrowed this from a guy. I don't have one. It's, it's kind of nice. I, I like to smoke quite a bit, I, you know, but normally I just do it more traditional. So, but, but I borrowed this just because I thought people might want to see it a little bit. Um, it, you know, some of the items that you can do. It is kind of cool. Well, yes. Yeah, when you think cold smoke, so anything you want to do, I mean, you want a little smoke like that or right. um, cheeses, things like that. Cheeses would be nice, too. And, and, you know, again, even whipped cream and meringues, you could do something, too. A lot of times you might, you see these cakes that were getting popular a couple of years ago that would have chilies in them, you know, so I would think maybe even some kind of smoke in a mousse or something like that might work pretty well with that. 
And they're about, I think I put it back there before, I think it's $99 maybe online. They might be more expensive at Williams-Sonoma, which you can buy them there, okay? You can get them there, but you, I think they're $99. Or you can do a shoebox. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, right? There is something fun about that kind of stuff, though, I, I have to admit, you know? Fast project, right? You know, anything that's got duct tape on it, I'm usually pretty excited about. Um, now, who's actually messed with one of these Paco jets before? Do you have one at your, at your program? You know, aren't they amazing? Yeah. I mean, they, they really are. They're so cool. This one, again, when, when we got ours, this was maybe 10 years ago, and I think ours was 2,500. It's gone up now to 4,800. And I, there's one on JB Prince. It's not a Paco jet. It's a little different version, and I think that's about 4,200. Ah. It, it's just, it really makes an amazing. What, what the idea is, if you can see the canister over here that Dave's got, you literally fill this up with, let's just say you wanted to make, to make it easy, strawberry sorbet. You literally, you see the line on there, kind of that little fill line. You could fill that up with strawberries. And honestly, sometimes when I make it and I stop at a grocery store and pick up one of those bag of frozen strawberries, they're going to be frozen anyway. It doesn't really matter. Okay, and I'll just literally drop the bag in there, and then I'll fill the rest of it up with simple syrup. Just put, you don't even have to do it, but I find simple syrup it gives us kind of a nice mouthfeel. I've seen people just use juice for it too. And you literally just freeze whatever you got in there. It's whole. So you've got this frozen berry suspended in simple syrup. And then when you actually put it into the machine itself, there's a small grinder right up top here. And you pick the number of portions that you want. And that grinder drops down and literally 2,000 R RPMs, okay, drops down and grinds up and you know, pocketize, I think is their, is their term for it, uh, pocketizes just whatever portion that you want. And then when you pull it out, it's the neatest thing. You can show it to the students, too, because you, you look into this thing and you see kind of this sorbet that's obviously much lighter than the berries themselves on the outside. But then you can see where it stopped pocketizing, and you can see the tops of the berries where they've just been cut perfectly off. And the consistency, I, I'm jealous about it. I mean, I, I could never, I guess maybe if you were really a pastry chef and you got out and you got all your machines out and really got the perfect syrup, you know, maybe you could work on it. The consistency is unbelievable. The mouthfeel, um, I've made a dark chocolate one, then it's dark chocolate, orange zest, and simple syrup. And, and that was it. And it tastes like, it, I mean, it tastes like the richest ice cream. And it's got very, you know, very little fat really that's in it. This was a, you know, a, a bittersweet chocolate that was in there. And it just makes a certain number of portions. It's kind of loud, you know, it really is. It almost looks a little bit like a, uh, um, I'm trying to say, like an espresso or coffee maker. They are pretty loud, but you can do some neat things. We, we did these really cool sorbets. We did a, a peach. Uh, blackberry and raspberry, and then we did the little twill cookies, and we made kind of the little palettes, you know, like the painters would use with your thumb going through it. You know, I'm, I'm talking. That is called a palette, right? Yeah, little, yeah. Okay. And we would put three of those up there, and then that would be that would be one of our desserts. We'd send it out, and obviously the palette was the cookie itself, and we had these three bright sorbets. Unbelievable, um, real nice. I'm telling you all this now, and also saying it costs a lot of money, and and it can also be used too for. You know, people are going to use it for forced meats and savory mousses. I really haven't done that. I don't find necessarily that the ice cream is the best out of it. Um, that's just me. But I, I, I have made uh, pesto out of it. Put pesto in there and just keep that. And if you've got an order that comes in, a pesto cream sauce, you can, again, pull it out, kind of pocko ties. It keeps a nice, nice color there because it's, you know, suspended. It, and you can even look here on this if you can look. I mean, you can see how light it is on the outside. And then right on the bottom, like the, whatever peaches or, or pineapple, whatever chunks that are in there, just perfectly cut off. It's a neat thing. Yes? Have you done force meats in there? I, I have not, no. I, I primarily have used Anyone else use it yeah, for force well, meats? I didn't do that. But I was at a demo a few years ago where they did force meats and it was uh, excellent. So how did they do that? Well, they put the whole would you use that for like a ravioli stuff? <coughs> what would you use it for then? Uh, they use it for sausage. Oh, sausage. Yeah, or maybe even quenelles. Mm -hmm. You know, put some quenelles maybe for the top of a dish. I think um, there's a small business in the And they make sorbet in a color by just pouring a liquid nitrogen into it. Huh. Is that basically the same thing as that? No, this is no. more, this is yeah, more this mechanical. Is Your product is in here, you freeze it. And then you're just using the blade. Yeah. Yeah. Much more. This is much more physical here. This one. Yeah. Not physical on our part, but physical on the machine's part. Yes. Right. You put it in there. 
Okay. This one, anti-griddle. Anybody use this one before? I mean, this is another one too. This literally, you turn it on and it freezes to minus 30 in about 10 to 15 minutes, non-adjustable. So you just, it only goes up to one temperature. Um, I normally spray it with some oil. I've seen people use parchment or plastic and you know, there's always gonna be, they, they never do it, but there's always gonna be students, oh, can I put my tongue on it? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Good idea, put your, put your tongue on it, yes, please. Um, and, and honestly too, I, ha I mean, I've used it, we have it, um, but I could certainly get along without it. It's not, I mean, it's kind of a neat wow thing that, that I've done before but I don't really use it a bunch. Have, have you used it much, Dave, as, as far as Demonstration any? purposes and, and not really. Ex yeah, I mean, and here's one here that I actually found online. This was a, it was like a mango curd, and then they had kind of a coconut lime, kind of a mousse thing that they poured over the top, almost making obviously what looks kind of like a, a, an egg type of thing, okay? I've done it quite, quite a number of times with creme anglaise. You can put some, some sticks down, put your creme anglaise, and kind of make like these nice little popsicles in a way. It's kind of neat. I mean, you know, I got well, one kid now in high school, but every year I would normally get the call from one of the teachers, can you come in and do a little demo? And I'd always bring this because this is just cool. I mean, everybody likes to see it. Okay. Um, frozen vinaigrettes I've seen people do too, do little spritzes of maybe olive oil or some type of vinaigrette that they'll set on the salad when it goes out and it'll start to just kind of melt a little bit. Okay. Um, if you put something on there like a ring, you can fill the rings up and have frozen desserts that can be frozen maybe on the outside inside itself is still kind of soft. This one, okay. Who's messed with liquid, liquid nitrogen? Anyone? It's a lot of fun. It, it really is, you know. Um, I, we, we're at an ag school, and I had students asking me about this, about liquid nitrogen. I didn't know much about it. So I thought, oh yeah, I'll get on it. And then go, like any educator, oh, I gotta research this, and I'm looking it up and everything. And I found out really that the liquid nitrogen really is kind of cheap for the liquid nitrogen itself. But this container here, this doer, Okay, and I looked it up where that came from. It was a Scottish scientist, his last name was Dewar. You know, he did pretty good. I guess he got this and then he did the whole Scotch thing. So he's a pretty, pretty good guy, I guess. But he actually came up with this Dewar and these are, you know, 500, 600 and up for these Dewars. So I came back and I reported to my students, guys, you know, I'm a nice guy, but I'm not gonna go out and spend, you know, $600 for one of these containers. And then the students being much smarter than me says, why don't you check with the science department? Oh yeah, good idea. So I checked with him and they actually didn't have one, but we have a animal husbandry program in our school. And this is actually used for bull semen, of all things, for literally freezing it. We have a guy on campus, and that's his job. He's very good at it, uh, Dr. Dave Thompson. Um, and that's kind of the joke on campus. You never shake Dave Thompson's hand. You just, you just say hello to him. But I contacted Dave Thompson, and he said, yeah. He goes, I I've got one. So he literally brought it over, and I didn't even get charged for it. And it was the coolest thing ever. You know? Yes? Oh, yes. I mean, but I'm just saying as far as the doers go. You know what I mean? In other words, I couldn't find the doer. He, he actually had several of them over there. What's that? I didn't think about that. What were we going to say, Chef? Well, I was going to say, what we use on our campus, um, we use Lexans. And we put it into it. We use the liquid nitrogen right away. These are so that when you put the lid on it, it doesn't evaporate. So okay. That'll sit for like an hour and you'll still have some nitrogen in there. So we put it right into the Lexan if you're going to use it right away. Well, I mean, and the one that I had too, I mean, literally was probably this tall. So, I mean, the one I had literally sat in my office for probably, you know, probably six weeks and still had some in there. It was huge. It was a big thing. But, uh, you know, it, you can also use thermoses. I've seen people use it before. Kind of the better thermoses, maybe like the old type. Uh, what are those green ones there? I'm trying to think of the. Yeah. You know, those work pretty well. Lids are supposed to be loose. And you definitely want to go goggles and gloves on that kind of thing. You don't really want to take a chance on that at all. Even though, really, it's not, you know, I, I, I'd feel much worse about you know, fryer oil, then I would probably liquid nitrogen, okay? Um, that's, what, that's what I'm told, yes, okay? It's minus 321 degrees. It's chilly, okay? Um, much smaller ice crystals, it, I'm not a pastry chef, but we all know when we're making ice cream or anything like that, the smaller crystals that you can have form, the better consistency that you're gonna have. So you can make ice cream really quickly. I haven't made it myself in a KitchenAid mixer, I, I actually prefer, just because I was nervous about it, honestly, I was just so nervous that if I started pouring it into that KitchenAid mixer, maybe it would get too cold and something might break on me. So I literally did it by hand. I literally had a bowl and I had a couple of students that I trusted to kind of pour it in there while I literally mixed it in. You put your ice cream in there. I didn't use any eggs. I just used cream and milk with sugar, vanilla. And literally I whisked it like crazy. Two students poured and every other student had their cell phone. 
They were, they were on it, you know? And I knew it was kind of a good thing because later that day I had students that weren't even in my class. Chef, that was awesome, I loved it. Where'd you see it? Oh, somebody put it on Facebook. That was like my first time ever I was on Facebook. I had to go, go home and tell my younger daughter who thinks I'm an absolute nerd that I'm cool, I'm on Facebook. So she thought that was, she thought that was a good thing. And then we also made some dipping Dots too. We just melted ice cream and then literally just dropped it into there. And then, you know, it does the same thing, kind of bubbles up a little bit. Is it actually gonna work really in a restaurant setting? The ice cream could. There's a lot of people that do that table side. I won't say a lot, but it's done. It's kind of a neat thing. Yes? You can drink a lot with it in some of the restaurants, too. Oh, no. Because they can freeze the alcohol. Okay. This guy I was talking about, too, David Arnold, a little bit earlier. He's got yeah. a, now he's got a bar called Dax, Dax and Booker in New York City, and he does all kinds of crazy things. He's probably doing yeah. liquid nitrogen. Yeah. Um, and then, again, this, this one here of cooking a steak sous vide, dips it in liquid nitrogen, and then deep fries it for a great crust. Okay? Kind of a neat thing. And I've also seen it done too for shucking clams and oysters. Okay, they literally put clams and oysters in there for, for 15 seconds, okay? Lift them out, put them onto a half sheet pan, put them in the refrigerator for a half an hour, literally to thaw, okay? And they're gonna be opening up and they come right off. Kind, kind of a neat thing, okay? Again, whether it's actually going to be really relevant in your restaurant, I'm not sure. But I, I tell you what though, I mean, you get this, the students are hooked. And then later on when you're teaching them some material that maybe is not as exciting, they're still, they're still with you. Have, have you used it much, Dave, other than just the ice cream type thing? I have not, just for the ice cream. Okay. It, it's, I can't wait to do it again. The students were really begging to see that again. Nice, yeah. You could almost do that and fold that into like a raspberry move kind of, you know, kind of building. Right? Hmm. I think I've seen people do that with bananas too, almost freeze it and then pound in a nail, I think. I think another cool application is take uh, fresh herbs, dip them in the nitrogen, and mm. pop them into a vita prep. It makes the perfect vita mm -hmm. It's just so tiny. Wow. Mm. This is a, a, another one here, piece of equipment, okay, I would imagine. How many people have, have used this before or have one? These are awesome. These really are. This is another thing, too. And, I, you know, as you get to a certain age in your kids, you know how you're kind of, you know, the, the, the kids get to a certain age, like, how does this guy know anything at all? But I actually was something. When I brought this home and showed my daughter this, I was cool because they have these at Starbucks. So I must, I must be on to something, okay? And I'm sure Starbucks probably has their own line, but they look pretty much exactly alike. Um, and it really is just a canister. It's got a little bit, little cartridges that go in, okay? You would take this off. Okay, put the cartridge right in here, pop that on. Whipped cream, okay. Um, foams, you can do carbonation if you want to. It's pressurized, I mean, if you put your whipped cream in there and it'll last for 10 days, okay, you can just keep it in there. It's nice, I mean, it's got a nice flavor to it. You can control how much sugar you want or don't want in there. If you want to put any other kind of flavors, you can certainly do it. They're around, you say about $100, and this is a, one of the smaller versions. I did a lot of research on it and people said, get the small one. You know, a lot of times the big ones are almost too big. This one worked pretty well, I and mean, it even fits in my refrigerator at home too, which, which that's important for me. So that's kind of, I, I've done a little bit with grapes. Yeah, it's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, you can you actually can, you know, do the carbon dioxide, put some grapes in there, kind of put a couple of canisters in that, and then take the grapes out a little bit later on. And it is you put pop in your mouth there, and you got this heavy duty carbonation, and it's kind of a neat Cherry thing. Cherry tomatoes too are great. And which really would probably be a, a nice thing too for a, for a drink. You know, some type of bar drink to have some fruit in there with carbonation. They're super high quality build. I mean, they really are. They, they come from Austria. They're very nice. If you get one, as long as someone doesn't walk out with it, you'll probably have it for, for quite a while. How do you do the grapes again? You just... You literally put the grapes right into the container itself. Oh, in the container. Yes. And then you get the, the, the uh, carbon dioxide, okay? Uh, yeah, carbon, and, and then just literally infuse it, okay? It, it infuses it with the gas, and the gas can't go anyplace, so the grapes literally suck it up, wow. okay? So you've got infusions that you can do, foams, which are kind of getting a little bit, I don't know, maybe they're a little bit old now. Whipped cream, tempura batter can also be used for it. Yes? I gotta try that too. I, now I haven't tried that. I've done it a lot of times with, with thermoses lately. You know, get a nice thermos like that, and, and you know, you can make it and put it in there and seal it up, and it stays pretty well on the line. I haven't given it a shot there. Too. Does it make it even lighter when it comes out? I imagine it's very, very airy. 
Nice. You, use, you don't use nitrous, you use the CO2. Oh, I'm sorry, it's that nitrous. Yeah, yeah. Right. Was that the holiday sauce? Yeah, the holiday sauce. That's yeah, a great idea. All, put those together. You, you take your sous vide holiday and put it in here. And then put it back in the back. You can see on the left here, there's actually a cake that was made. I've seen this done before where people will literally make a batter and get that, you know, get that aerated and then put it into a, like a disposable coffee cup. Put a couple holes in the coffee cup before you put it in there, of course. Pop it into the microwave for about 40 seconds or so. It literally cooks there. When it comes out, you turn it upside down, kind of like the old angel food cake where you turn it upside down so it stays extended you know, while it dries. And um, then you can, now, normally you wouldn't want to do that, but this was, I watched a guy do it one time for a competition. He had one hour to do it, and he very quickly made this, this brioche batter, cooked it in the microwave, and then when it came out, he literally pulled it up, and he kind of uh, toasted it a little bit, and he used that as a garnish for a salad. He had, there was some quail, there was some uh, foie gras, there was like a blackberry gastrique. I'm trying to think of all his components, but he literally made brioche croutons within the one hour time limit. It was kind of cool to see. And then also they've done an infusion over here on, on the right hand side where they literally have again pressurized, put some herbs in there and literally pressurized it so whatever they're going to inject in it has got the flavors there. I really haven't used it like that. I don't actually have the needle. I guess that's a separate thing you can buy. Has anyone used that? The, the needle one here? I don't even know if you've done it before. It's a neat piece of equipment and again it, it's, I'm happy to pay that money because it lasts for a long time. Right. Then pressure cooker. You know, I like this a lot, I really do. Between $40 and $250, I think the one over here was about $100. Um, you know, we, I think we've all used them before. We probably all have stories about them, right? Everybody, <laughs> Mr. Oh, I remember my mom, she shot this all over the, mm -hmm. yes. Um, <laughs> Roke, is it Roke Food? Somebody like that makes one that's electric and you can program it so you don't have to worry about melting the handles on your gas ranges. Oh, okay, and huh. at Costco, I got one for 60 bucks. It looks like a slow cooker, right? Yeah. yeah. It'll brown, it'll because it's a whole process of braising. You don't have to sear it off in another pan. Is, is anyone using these in their, in their kitchen, right? You're cooking, I mean, in other words, you're cooking with them in there? Right. Good. Okay. It is kind of, it's kind of a neat thing. I mean, they're not really big, but again, it's, it kind of helps you uh, mm -hmm. as far as this, this, uh, competitions. You've got one hour to do it, and in one hour, there's only so much cooking techniques you can really do. So this is a good way to allow you to, to braise in that one hour time period there. Chicken broth in 40 minutes. I agree. Get a get a get a nice one. This is this is about a hundred dollar one here. This is actually a pretty good quality one too. But yeah, the real cheap ones go out pretty quickly. Okay, and I know we we started a little bit late, so I'm trying to speed things up just just a bit here. Um, the chicken broth 40 minutes makes incredible chicken broth. It really does. Again, it's not making a ton of it, so maybe if there was a really big version that could be used in industrial kitchens, that'd be great. Oh, Electrolux makes a pressure breeze. Do they? Good, good size? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good size? Okay. Oh. And then hydrocolloids, okay? There is a company, there's a lot of companies out there, right? The Chef's Steps, they don't sell chemicals themselves, do they? There's more, okay. Um, I, I was going to Modernist Pantry just because that was the first place that I went. Okay, Do they probably, I'm guessing they probably sell them a little bit bigger amounts, so probably the canisters. Willpower. Yeah. And Willpower and, and Chef Rubber. Oh, I've seen Chef, Chef Rubber. Chef Rubber sells the big, big ones. Yeah. These are basically gums, okay, They're, it's, it's kind of a, you know, just a, an all-encompassing term there. They you know, enhance viscosity, texturize, emulsify. They get used a lot of things now in kitchens. It's amazing what you can do and the type of textures that you can get. And the neat part about it is, this is one too, because this whole thing was about making sure that you can do it kind of on the cheap, because not all of us are at schools where we just have these unlimited budgets. I'm not sure anybody's out of school that has an unlimited budget, but you know, some of us had lower budgets than others. These are about six to nine dollars for a 50 gram, 50 gram package like this. You can buy larger ones, but normally you're using a pretty small amount of these anyway. So, you know, six to nine dollars for these, very affordable way, and I think, uh, Chef, you mentioned before too, the preciseness, I mean, you know, everything's gotta be the precision that you've got going with this too. The students are measuring. This kid actually came with a small little, you know, little scale here. So it's always a good thing when you see students, instead of just guessing this much, literally, I need four grams, and they're literally measuring this off. And I just find that when they do this type of thing, it just, they get better in other items too. It's kind of like when you, you know, competitions, a lot of people used to knock competitions. Oh, it's not really real to do this kind of thing. And a lot of it, maybe that's, maybe that's the case, but the things that you learn in competition, 
help you out later on to the precision, the attention to detail, the teamwork, the time, all of that. A, a lot of those things really work well. So this is another thing. I thought these, this was a lot of fun. And this was the one where the students were coming to me. Literally, it's like, guys, i got to stop. Because I, I literally was just putting it on my own credit card. It was cheap enough anyway. It really was. And it lasts a while. It, it does. It lasts for a pretty good while. And, and the biggest hit of all, I think, was... You know, these culinary crystals, which are pop rocks, okay? And you can, of course, flavor these however you want to flavor them. I did some ba bacon pop rocks one time, because um, everything tastes better with bacon. And uh, the ones in here actually, they're almost popped out, but these actually were mango pop rocks that we put together and used them as a garnish on a salad. And, you know, we didn't tell the students. The ones in, in the back obviously knew what they were. But then the people out in the dining room, they're eating, and all of a sudden this stuff's kind of going off in their mouth there, and it catches them by surprise. And if you're of a certain age who really didn't have Pop Rocks when you were growing up, it really catches you by surprise. You know? I've heard dogs and cats actually get a kick out of these too, but I've never tried it with that. Okay? And then you can see the various, these are just a couple of them out here. Meat glue is kind of can be a little bit fun to play around with. Okay? Um, the spirification we've all done, everyone's seen that. That's fairly affordable, it really is. Okay, as you mentioned, there's different pHs on these things. You're going to have to adjust it a little bit, but students really like that type of thing. They do. And there's a machine up here that Dave's got, a, not a machine, but a little, Surge. okay. <laughs> All right, so you fill it up, drop it into your bath. Pipetting. Yeah. Probably the best example I've ever seen for this, too, there was a chef that was doing a kind of a, a nice wedding, and the, uh, one of the appetizers was actually uh, caviar. Okay, and they had a couple of vegetarians, so they actually ended up doing kind of an asparagus spirification. So they ended up serving these asparagus, look pretty much like asparagus caviar, that they served to the, to the you know, you know, numerous veg vegetarians that were in the, in the event. I thought that was kind of a neat thing to do. All right? And in YouTube, you can see some unbelievable chef steps, as you mentioned before. You see this out there. It really is neat. It's a lot of fun to, to mess around with this. And don't worry if you don't know much about it. It's not, it really isn't that difficult to understand. And if you can go out and watch these videos, you, you can certainly, you can bring it back to your students. And they'll teach you a lot, too. Mm -hmm. they, they pick up on this pretty quickly. Resources here, okay. Um, this, the one at the bottom here, Ideas in Food, kind of interesting. They do some pretty neat books, too. And it's not really molecular gastronomy, but they really break down the science of cooking. Um, questions? Anyone? We were that good? We covered everything? Is anyone, can, can I ask you, is anyone actually thinking about maybe taking, you know, trying to take some of this stuff and, and, and roll with it a little bit, say next semester? Give it a shot? Some of them really aren't that bad. I mean, try out the little, the uh, thermal circulator. Nice. Well, you know, there's another one too. I was going to include even an indu induction burner too. I kind of forgot to put it in there. Dehydrators, you're right. I mean, it's, you start doing some of this and you start thinking, wow, I, I could use that. I think a good one of those is maybe two to two to five hundred X caliber. I think supposedly makes the best of those. Okay, um, give it. I, 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 I will promise you this though. Give it a shot. Your students will love it. They they really will. Your students will absolutely love it. And I have found they not only will will like it for that, but it has carryover. In the rest of your classes, they're going to want to take classes with you, not because you're necessarily going to be doing this, but they know you're going to teach them something. So it really is. It, it's a nice way to get your students super involved in the class.